Picture yourself in one of these scenarios. You go shopping and your credit card transaction is denied despite the fact that you know you have money in your account. Or you go to an ATM machine and you're informed that your withdrawal request has been denied. Or you're a public official, such as a school business administrator, county treasurer, municipal finance manager, pension fund administrator, or anyone who has responsibility for protecting public taxpayer funds. You're informed that all accounts have been frozen until further notice. As you investigate why you can't access money you know should be available, you find out that the bank has failed and has been closed until further notice by the FDIC. You also discover that the government will be confiscating part of your deposits in order to stabilize the bank. You believe that this can't happen here because the FDIC protects your money. You may have placed your money into one of the big banks because it has large vaults and is protected by the government. You may have placed public monies into a large bank because they're collateralized and the government will back them. Therefore, you think these funds are safe. All of these assumptions are not based on the facts. Perhaps you recall that in Cyprus, depositors' money was confiscated in order to stabilize the banks. Similar plans are already in place to do the same in the U.S. and other countries. In a nutshell, the banks in Cyprus were over-leveraged to the point that their liabilities exceeded their gross domestic product. Because the global bailouts of large banks in 2008 were so politically unpopular, a global banking troika of the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank and the European Union imposed a bail-in in which bank customers were to have some of their savings seized in order to stabilize the banks. The losses to some clients were as high as 60%. Cyprus was the test run. Now that's where the European Union kind of let the cat out of the bag, what they planned to do on a bigger scale. But depositors took a real haircut. Interestingly though, of course, the big boys got out. In the days before, they went to, after depositors' money, you know, the small time saver, $150 million, billion, I forget the number, left the Cyprus banks because the insiders knew what was coming. And the insiders will know what's coming when the next U.S. bank burns down. They'll get out and they'll leave the mom and pop depositors and maybe city governments holding the bag. In order to protect themselves, the Cyprus government closed the banks 12 days and people had limited access to their money. Long lines formed at the ATM machine. The fact is, that the confiscations in Cyprus were not a one-time event. The eventuality for this had already been planned in advance, and there are plans in place for confiscations of depositor accounts in New Zealand, the European Union, Canada, England, and the United States. And we passed Dodd-Frank legislation. And people think, well, that's it for bailouts. No, no, that's not it. Actually, it's just going to be a bail-in. In order to maintain liquidity in failed banks, the European Union and the Federal Reserve have a policy of bailing in, which means you seize depositors' deposits. Those could be mom and pop, up to their $250,000. It could be a city's deposits on deposit. It could be bondholders. That's what happened in Cyprus. That's what's happening right now with the Cooperative Bank in London, England, and that's what the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the Bank of England have jointly agreed to do here in the United States. The large global and Wall Street banks are the ones at most risk because they've been gambling with depositor money on risky derivative bets and other speculative investment devices, which means that when, not if, these bets start going bad, the banks will be on the hook for their deficient value. According to the Bank for International Settlements, which is essentially a central bank for the world's central banks, the notional value of these derivative contracts is an astounding $700 trillion. Think $700,000 billion. The entire world's GDP is only $70 trillion. There's not enough money on the planet to cover these bets. What most people don't understand is that once you give a bank your money, the money is legally no longer yours. Under the law, depositors are considered unsecured creditors to the bank and are treated as such under any bankruptcy proceeding. 
This type of loss happened with the collapse of MF Global. And while MF Global was a futures trading company and not a bank, the blueprint for confiscations was delivered here. The losses of customer funds were upheld by the legal system with the Sentinel case. Another important fact is this. These speculative derivatives have super priority status in a bankruptcy proceeding, which means that any derivative contract holder gets paid first, before shareholders, creditors, and depositors like you. It could well be that local government deposits are at risk in the event of the bail-in of one of the major banks in Wall Street when they next fail. Those are unsecured deposits. Now, Wall Street likes to say they've been collateralized, but the derivatives holdings of the major banks is several times the world's gross domestic product. There isn't enough money in the world to cover major losses in that market. So if they start to go down, first the counterparties to derivatives get covered. That's the new law. They get their money first. You'll get your money, you, a, you an individual depositor or you a city, if there's any left. What you might get instead is equity in the bank. So instead of having $400 million to meet your city's payroll, you may have $200 million and $200 million in new stock in the bank which you, in which you've just become a shareholder. But try meeting a payroll in stock in a failed bank. If you think that the FDIC will still come riding to the rescue, consider these facts. This chart will look at three figures. The FDIC insurance fund balance, the total deposits in U.S. banks, and the total derivatives exposure of the big banks. The FDIC has approximately $25 billion in its fund to cover losses. The total deposits in U.S. banks totals $9,283 billion. The U.S. banks' derivatives total is $297,514 billion. The FDIC could only cover 0.25% of all deposits, and the FDIC could only cover 0.008% of the derivatives. Looking at the FDIC Bank of England joint paper summary, the text clearly says that in the U.S. they will use the powers granted under the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act and losses will be assigned to shareholders and unsecured creditors. Remember that as a depositor in a bank, under the law, you are an unsecured creditor. Moving further on down in this document, the text clearly says that the strategy for a failed global systemically important financial institution will be to assign losses to shareholders and unsecured creditors. Going further down the same document, you will see that the text clearly says that a resolution strategy for a failed, globally, systemically important financial institution will be to assign the losses to shareholders and unsecured creditors. Remember that you are now looking at an official government document and the plans for confiscation. If you're a public official with fiduciary responsibility to protect public monies, this news is critically important with far-reaching implications about what your responsibility demands. If you can't deposit public monies into the large Wall Street banks without being at proven risk of losing access to it to confiscation under existing law, what options are there? Well, one option would be to create a public bank for your municipality, like North Dakota did 94 years ago. Their public bank was completely unaffected by the Wall Street bank collapses and financial trials back in 2008, and in fact, boasted one of their largest profits ever while mighty global financial institutions fell. The Bank of North Dakota, which treats its public funds as a utility rather than a speculative fund to gamble for profits, has a simple purpose, to preserve and protect its assets while investing in local priorities instead of non-local international corporations. It is completely independent of global banker greed and risky behaviors. Its money cannot be confiscated. We're making the argument that the biggest banks on Wall Street really aren't safe. 
that they've got so much exposure in derivatives and who knows what else, they're in danger of going down and taking depositors with them. We think money is much safer closer to home. It's also more productively used. All the money Philadelphia has on deposit, let's say Wells Fargo, that money's not being put to work in Philadelphia. Let's put the money locally where it can be put to use in Philadelphia. Public officials need to be clear about this risk. While the prospect of fund confiscation sounds startling, it is nonetheless true that the risk is not only there, it is promised to take place if such bank failures occur once again. And you're probably aware that such failures are expected by many, if not most, financial observers. This is your moment, a time to step up to the plate, look around at the environment and the financial players pitted against you, and to act prudently in the interests of your community. The era of blind trust in the institutions of global finance is over. Public fiscal officers and citizens alike would be well served to learn more about how to create a local public bank and what it might look like to have a new financial engine that provides for community growth, fund security, and increased local investment. There is now an urgent choice to be made at every municipal level. Either leave your public money in the hands of proven gamblers with the promise that it will be confiscated when more bad deals go down, or take a bold, innovative step to empower and safeguard community funds by adopting the proven public bank alternative. So consider yourself warned. Money is not safe in the big banks. The MF Global losses, the Cyprus confiscations, the legal precedents of the Sentinel case, the FDIC Bank of England joint paper, the plan for confiscations in Canada, New Zealand, and the European Union should all be sending red flags. Personal accounts, municipal money, county money, university money deposited in the big banks is all at risk. The plans for confiscation have been developed. They have been approved and they are awaiting the next crisis.